Conway Hall, London, where ethics matter. This afternoon, uh, the next talk is about Sarah Moore, the Witch of Leon Sea. Sarah Moore was the subject of a Lee legend, an evil sea witch who raised the great storm of the estuary, caused havoc around the town, and sank a plethora of boats. It's written by Sid Moore, who's with us this afternoon. She's the author. She's quite a prolific author, actually. She's got lots of books, uh, the Essex Witch Museum Mysteries. There are lots of them at the back, including the two latest, The Twelve Even Stranger Days of Christmas and Strange Tricks. So rather than taking questions after this, she will be at the back of the room signing all of the books that you will inevitably want to buy. Thank you ever so much for coming. Welcome, Sid. Hello, good afternoon. Um, this, this talk is actually about um, my journey to write the, the Drowning Pool, which unfortunately, I've just learned, is out of print at the moment. Well, it's reprinted at the moment, but I have got loads more fantastic books at the back, and I will be signing them later. Um, let me just get this going. Do I have to press a button? Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, Sarah Moore, The Sea Witch of Leon Sea. So, quite often when I start my talks, I have to tell people where Leon Sea is. But as we're in London, I imagine quite a few of you know where it is. Yes, nods. Um, so, it's, it's here. Uh, about 30 miles east of London, um, for anybody who, who doesn't know it. Um, and it's quite an old town. Um, it was mentioned in the Doomsday book as well. Um, and yes, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research and how, what, how it led me to write my book, The Drowning Pool, about Sarah Moore and why I wrote it. So um, Sarah Moore, as Deborah said, um, was a, a sea witch in Leon Sea. And I first heard about her when the pub named after her opened, which was about 20 years ago. Um, and when they opened, they had this sign here, um, which you can see on the left. Uh, it was based on a painting, which is on the right. And this is a photograph of the painting. The painting was gleaned from living memory of Sarah. And this uh, pub sign is meant to show her um, bent with a hooked nose, not a classic witch's hat, but with a, a, a sort of stove hat on, and her witch's sack on her back. Now, when I went to um, the pub there, um, I said to them, obviously, you know, my name is Sid Moore, and I'm a little bit narcissistic, and I first said, so, come on, who's this Sarah Moore then? And they told me the legend, and I would tell it to you as they told me. Um, so the legend of Sarah Moore was that she was an evil, haggard old woman who was a witch who used to sit down in the old town on Bell Wharf. And for a penny, she would bless sailors with a good wind. Now, according to the legend, one day the captain of the smack rocked up and he was a foreigner and a zealous man. And when he heard about the witch, he forbade all of his crew to give her any money. So... They went out. When Sarah heard about this, again, according to the legend, she flew into a rage and she drew up the great storm of 1870, which she threw out at the estuary. Now, the smack was already going out there. It caught the smack. The ship was rocked from side to side. The sailors were trying to get down the rigging, but it was all snaring. One of them said, this is the work of the witch, the witch, whereupon the captain of the smack picked up an axe, went to the mast and felled it with three strikes. As soon as the mast hit the deck, the storm disappeared. When the beleaguered crew got back to Bell Wharf, they got out and there, to their horror, they saw the dead body of Sarah Moore with three axe wounds to her. 
It's quite a good story, isn't it? So, as a mystery writer, I thought, oh, that's quite good, you know, murder, mayhem, magic, I like it. So I thought, I'm going to you know, find out about this, and I started doing my own little bit of digging. And one of the things that I found out was there was actually an alternative ending. So the legend, most of the legend was the same. The, the ship went out, the storm came up. But in this particular version, uh, the boat capsized, all souls were lost apart from the captain, who, when he got back to Bell Wharf, stood up and swore vengeance on the sea witch. The next day, her headless body was found floating in Doom Pond. Okay. Now, Doom Pond was a place in Leon Sea. Um, this is a picture of it. Um, it was also the Pottery Pond. I mean, Doom Pond has also got a really great name, obviously. Um, from a mystery writer, like it. But actually, when I researched it, I found out it was probably called Dome Pond originally because of the kilns and the shape that they were. Uh, but it was also known as the Drowning Pool. And this is possibly because, well, the, again, there's myths and legends that uh, the witches were ducked there. Um, now, of course, that, that mixes two things up as well because witches weren't ducked, they were swam. Scolds were ducked. Um, what happened with witches, and we did have three of them, uh, were, and people probably know this here, but they were tied from their right thumb to their left toe and then thrown into a body of water. Um, if you sank to the bottom and probably drowned, uh, then the water accepted you, so you were innocent. If you floated, you were guilty and then taken off for usually more torture um, or hanging. Um, so... Again, we have this story that Doom Pond was also called the Drowning Pool. And we had, uh, yeah, we had three witches, Joan Allen in 1576, Alex Soles in 1622, and Joan Rao, who was part of the Matthew Hopkins witch hunt in 1645. So this could be one of the reasons why it was also called the Drowning Pool. Or according to one, uh, a cab driver I had recently, some women's liber recently wrote a book about it, which was all up the witches. <laughs> um, Doom Pond, though, has had an unfortunate history. Um, somebody did build on, on it, I think, in the 20s, and it was a bungalow. The bungalow, according to legend, and if anybody knows this, I, can't, I haven't been able to verify it, but apparently there's a double murder there, and then it slid into the water. In the 70s, uh, Spa built a supermarket on it. Uh, and I do know this to be true, as my brother's friend's mum worked there. And one day they went in and they were putting the tins up and they started to notice that the tins were going down, sliding down, falling off. And very, very quickly, uh, it slid into the pond. And this is the aftermath of it here. Now, this is what it looks like now. Um, this is called Southside. Um, it's built on top of the pond. Um, apparently, they have a, a, a pump in the bottom, but it does flood. No one lives there locally who is local um, because, you know, it's got a reputation, but also, you know, it's built on a pond. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that it's also next to a new development of houses. Uh, well, actually, new development of flats, which was completed at the end of 2019, and they're not selling like hotcakes, as the developers named it, the Corona House. <laughs> um, honestly, that stretch of road, it's like for me, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, back to Sarah Moore. Uh, so I was really interested in her. I wanted to know, was she a real person? So I went down to um, the Heritage Centre, which has got a museum behind it, and it's actually got a cottage, which we've got photos of later which is sort of done up like a fisherman's cottage for the era that she lived in. Anyhow, I asked them, they said, no, we think she's just an amalgam of witch legends. So I was a bit oh, fed up with that. I don't really like it. So I went over to the Essex Records office and I just kept researching through the parish records. And then one day I found this. Ta -da. Um, this is Sarah Moore's burial registration. Um, you can see her at the bottom and this was actually in 1867. So 
remember that the great storm of the estuary which she was meant to have thrown was in 1870. So it was three years after she was dead, so she couldn't have possibly been responsible for it, even if you do believe that human beings can control the weather. Um, they put her age down as 80, and this was very interesting as I started to research her more because it was more misinformation. Um, but anyhow, once I had this date, it was brilliant, so I could go on and I could carry on researching either side of it. So um, I carried on and I found this, which is on the 1851 census. Actually, I always say I found this, but I didn't find it. My beautician found it. I was having a facial and I was telling her what I was doing and she said, oh, I'm on Ancestry, do you want me to have a look? And I was like, yeah, go on, babe. So she went over there and the next time I had a facial, she was like, oh my God, look what I found. I was like, great. <laughs> And so I looked at it, and we both looked at it, and we were like, oh, my God, she was a mangler. You know, that is such back-breaking work. And we were like, no wonder she looked so knackered at 80. She wasn't 80, she was 67. Um, but she probably was really broken over and bent because mangling was really back-breaking work. And did she have that witch's sack on her back, as depicted in the pub sign? Or was it her washing bag that she was always ferrying around? Anyhow, this point um, was quite a tragic point for Sarah. She had been married twice, um, both to widowers. So um, she'd inherited children, uh, stepchildren, and she'd also had her own children. Um, at this point, she had lost six children, and she had about nine. Not all of them she had to provide for, but a lot of them she did. Um, and this is the point that she sort of became magically able, but I think it's really worth remembering there was no social security or welfare back then. Um, Sarah started making extra money, aside from the washing, um, by um, guessing the sex of unborn babies. She also used to make herbal potions. She also used to do this um, sort of reading the estuary sand. So she'd get estuary sand, she'd put it into a bucket of water, and then she'd read the patterns at the bottom, which was a bit like um, tea leaves. I'm just going to have a drink. Hang on. And I kind of think that her reputation would have been that of a cunning woman or a wise woman, had it not been for two episodes that unfortunately befell her. Mm. The first one was in 1850, and there was a huge cholera epidemic here in London. And like all things in London, it spread down to Essex. And unfortunately, Sarah's two biological sons, who were teenagers, died um, between the 12th and the 16th of August. Uh, the following year, on the anniversary of their deaths, she was obviously very grief-struck, and uh, as the almanac says, she went into a gin frenzy. We've all been there. <laughs> um, let us not judge. Uh, when she came out of it, she was full of remorse. And so she um, put together a herbal potion, which she laid on the steps of all of those people, all of those households that had cholera. Um, unfortunately, none of the babies survived. It, you know... Again, if we look back from the 21st century, we know that herbs and ale are not going to cure cholera. But the cry went up in the old town that Sarah had poisoned these children because she could not bear to see new life while her children lay rotting in the graveyard. Okay, so the next thing that happened, which really sealed her reputation, was a couple of years later... And um, she was living on Strand Wharf at this time. And this is a picture of uh, the kind of like uh, cottages that they have on Strand Wharf. So they were, very, they were built very, very closely together with alleyways in between them. And the um, Heritage Centre has also got a cottage which they've renovated. Um, some interior shots here. Anyway, the day was windy and out in the alleys there were children, four children, who were watching her, they saw Sarah leave her cottage. Um, they saw that she had left the door open. It was banning. 
banging. So one of them said, come on, I want to go and find out what the witch's lair is like. So the four children went in. It was very, very dark, so they lit a candle and put it on the table. One of them, Lizzie Lungley, had warts all over her hands. So she decided she was going to have a look, try and get down some of the potions. So she reached up to one. Just at that moment, again, bang, 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 one of the boys who was on the lookout heard steps coming down the passage. He shouted, it's the witch, it's the witch. Whereupon, Lizzie trembled with the bottle. It opened on top of her. All the contents came out over her and Emily, who was the four-year-old who was with her. Emily, also taking fear, grabbed hold of Lizzie. As she did, she knocked the candlestick over. The flame jumped from the stick, from the candle, onto the liquid. Again, we now have a legend, and the legend says that Sarah burst through the door. Her eyes were full of wrath, and she shot sparks at the girls who went up into balls of flame. Not content with burning them to death, she picked up her witch's sack and ran after them, trying to catch them. So again, when I was reading this, I was thinking, gosh, you know, what was going on there? One of the boys later said that in the bottle there was paraffin, but, you know, we'd never let uh, the truth in the way of a good witch hunt here. Um, so that, that was ignored. But, you know, we know that actually if a candlestick was knocked over, if the flame licked onto this paraffin, the door bursts open, oxygen comes in, blows up the kids. Is she trying to catch them in her witch's bag or is she trying to put out the flames? Um, I know what I thought. So I decided that really I wanted to tell her side of the story. Um, so I started, I carried on researching. I didn't want to write a historic novel because I couldn't be bothered to do all the research. Little did I know I'd spend all the rest of my life researching. Um, but I, I carried on. And also, I really wanted to debunk this. So I didn't want to be steeped in that, that age of superstition. I wanted to have a kind of 21st century perspective on it. Um, and I carried on. And then I found this photograph. Uh, which is, um, this is Walker King, who signed Sarah's uh, burial registration. He's there with the beard at the back. And this is obviously kind of a, a form of Victorian paint, um, photograph. But what really caught me was what's up in the left-hand corner. Um, it, to me, it looked like there were souls trapped in there. I could make out faces, pareidolia. Probably, Tim, is it? Um, but anyhow, I thought, gosh, okay, they look like ghosts. And I thought, great, I can write a ghost story. Um, and so ghosts do exist in my universe. Um, and this is really because, you know, when you tell people that you write about witches, they're like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And you're like, well, actually, they didn't have magical powers and they were victims of a miscarriage of justice. And they're like, oh, but I've got ghosts. Um, so, you know, there are lots of ghosts. There are, uh, one of, you know, it is my mission to kind of de debunk a lot of these uh, witch myths because most witch myths uh, are conflations of lots of different things and you will always find that these people have been scapegoated and bullied and blamed and othered. So um, I do try to rehabilitate their stories and, and give them a voice as well. So I decided to write The Drowning Pool so we have a contemporary um, Sarah, who uh, starts to feel like she's being haunted, needs to investigate what happened. Um, so I wrote, I wrote The Drowning Pool. It was published in 2011. Um, I had the launch, anyone guess where that was? I had the launch at the Sarah Moore, and I made all the staff read it as well. So they did read it and, and it was brilliant because actually a few months after they read it they took to the um, brewery and they changed the sign. So it's now this. To give her a little more dignity. Although I was there just the other day doing a bit of writing and this popped up. <laughs> Sarah says why not have one more. <laughs> okay. But she's right really isn't she? Um, and I think, I, I don't know how fast I've gone, but uh, 
Am I nearly done? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, well, that, I mean, basically, that's really it. So that is how I came to write Sarah Moore, the story of Sarah Moore in The Drowning Pool. Um, one of the things that I did um, when I was write, researching Sarah Moore was I put Essex witches into Google, very academic, um, I didn't find anything about Sarah Moore on there. But I did find out the statistic, which was that between 1560 and 1680, in Hertford, Surrey, and Sussex, there was a total number of indictments um, for witchcraft, which were 500, I'm sorry, which were 185. And for Essex on its own, there was 503, which is very significantly more. And so I made it my mission then to sort of dig into these statistics and really, the result of this was my book, Witch Hunt, which was about the Matthew Hopkins witch scare. But also, um, I had so much information, as I found out so much about these women, uh, that I decided that what I wanted to do was I wanted to try and get a lo an exhibition at the... We, Saffron was going to have a museum at that point. So I tried to get a museum, the museum to sort of help me with an exhibition about witch hunts and about intolerance and bullying. Um, so I went off and I found lots of artefacts that we could uh, use. Did a, um, a grant to the Arts Council to, for research and development, and the Arts Council said no. So I thought, do you know what, sod it, I'm just going to do one anyway. I'm just going to make it a fictional museum. And really, that's where I started the Essex Witch Museum. So, and lots of people come and ask me where it is. Well, it's, it's in my head, but it's also in the books that are at the back. Um, and you can read all about them. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>